Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the HUD OCIO Learning Session. I'm Dr. Melanie Cohen. I would like to thank all of you who are here in our live audience and welcome new audiences. I understand each month we get some new audiences. So welcome. I'm glad that you found us, and I hope that you find our sessions to be beneficial to you. So today what we're going to be talking about is new, using new media in times of crisis. And uh, we're very fortunate to have two experts with us. We have Dr. Claudine Schweber, Dr. Christopher Kaysen, both from the University of Maryland, University College. Um, and uh, I think without any further ado, I'm going to get right to the presentation and the discussion. So uh, why don't we start with you, Claudine? Thank you. Hi. This is called the New Media Tsunami and Crisis Management. And um, shortly we will get the screens to show the slides. We called it that because of the world we're living in, which is as there's a crisis, there seems to be a lot happening simultaneously in the communication environment, not just one person or two communicating to the organization or to the people trying to help or the people from the organization out, but lots of things happening at the same time. And so we wanted to talk about what that might mean. Why do we care? Yes, we know there's Twitter and Facebook and all that, but so what? How does this impact crisis management? And so we'll be looking at, shortly it will appear on the screen, the kinds of new media we have and what that really means in terms of the impact on an organization that might be crisis prone rather than crisis prepared. And you'll have us, we will be asking people from the audience what agencies or what examples you might have of how, what media you're using if there is something coming up or if there is an ex um, a problem. As you know, we've just been hearing about MERS, uh, the potential or concern about that. We've had a problem with um, other kinds of <clears throat> measles or when there are food allergies or something. How do you get the word out when there's a lot of things happening at the same time? And of course, we'll make some suggestions, but mostly we also want to hear from you, those of you who are in the physical audience. What is your agency doing or what have you personally had to do or how do you keep track when things are coming at you? So thank you. This is something you should um, be familiar with but just wanted to give some concrete examples of the kinds of things that you may have experienced or been part of. And the hurricanes, I mean, we all, Hurricane Sandy, we know about these things. Health and Human Services um, had some information and there was concern when there was some kind of peanut allergy. Of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, if you get on their website, you will see a link, a click, that says alerts or as something comes up, they will right tell you on the website and we'll be talking a little bit about how do you find this? Should it be push technology? It should be get on that site and it should be right there, whatever button. Or do you have to scroll through three or four and figure out and then find yourself Googling it? Duh. Um, so these are some examples you'll see here of course, here at, um, at HUD, and I've looked through, we've looked through that website and seen the huddle. I saw that. And part of it is, how do you find it in an emergency or crisis quickly? And what does that mean to push it out while everybody's coming in and saying, what am I going to do? There was the floods in Arkansas. All this stuff's coming at you. So we'll be looking at that as well. So just a quick sense of what this means, and please add, you see that we're talking primarily about social media, and the key here, which you may have experienced, is that the user of this is both the author and the audience. Somebody's sending out a tweet, and they're watching, listening, responding, hearing what's going on. So at the same time, these things are happening, and that makes it even harder to manage, get a handle on, control, things like that. Here is some of the list of <clears throat> what it means, the new media today, and this is one of two slides, just to let you know it's a big, and this is a temporary list. And as we look at this one, which has <clears throat> the blogs, the podcasts, social networking sites. Anybody here on 
Facebook the, in the real, um, the live audience? What about Twitter? Any Twitter, can, can I say Twitterites? I'm not quite sure what the right <laughs> word is. <laughs> What's that? Twits. Twits, ooh. <laughs> A whole new meaning. <laughs> and we see here also um, mobile messages that you sent to a device. And here's some more examples. We all know about WikiLeaks and this Wikipedia. Uh, you want to know something, when was someone born, or what did they write, and where do you go? Wikipedia. And then hopefully you don't have to correct it, because it may not be accurate, as you know, but they have a spot, and so on. And on the bottom, we put down listservs, something we many of us are familiar with, because we have them ourselves in our neighborhoods. You want to find out in your, in your neighborhood um, who's got a good plumber, and you're not walking up and down or um, talking to your neighbors one after another, the neighborhood listserv will share that information as well as other kinds of things. So this is the variety. And I want to ask, what agencies um, are represented here? HUD? Formerly DOE. Formerly DOE. You, I'm sorry, you're HUD? Are there others who are not from HUD here at the moment, physically? Well, we have somebody here from DOD, and we have a, a very wide internet audience. That's right. So I can't hear from the internet audience. <laughs> Maybe that will be the next stage of technology, which would be great to make it a little more interactive. And so we're going to be looking to you to give us some examples of how you've experienced it, what you've had to do, things that worked or even didn't work. But mostly, here's what we had to do. And to look at the key role and the impact, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, over to you, Chris. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, good morning again. Uh, now, when it comes to new media technology, social media in particular, uh, we're going to discuss various aspects of what it means to be a crisis prepared organization or company mm -hmm. versus a crisis prone organization or company. Uh, there are many characteristics that distinguish a crisis prepared uh, organization from a crisis prone organization. The use of social media being one of them. Uh, also, it's important to take note that as we talk about social media, we have to remember that these tools can aid as well as hinder crisis communication efforts uh, of a corporation or organization, whether it's crisis prepared or crisis prone. Now, one of the benefits as well as drawbacks, depending on, on your vantage point of social media, is that it's geographically borderless. Unlike traditional print and broadcast communication, uh, which was very much one way, an organization sent out a press release, had a press conference, put a commercial up, or did something in a newspaper or magazine to uh, disseminate a message. Uh, social media is very much borderless, multi-way, uh, anyone with a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, okay. or a laptop can communicate in real time anywhere in the world. So it transcends uh, physical boundaries. And because of that, uh, communication is now no longer the sole province of an organization uh, that wants to communicate. It's uh, a shift in power as a result of the advent of new media technologies, and in particular, social media. As I indicated, uh, social media is very much multi-channel, multi-way. Uh, it's not only bi-directional, where uh, I communicate to you, you communicate back to me, but there are other individuals, organizations on the periphery that get into the discussion by virtue of you know, visiting a Facebook page uh, or uh, following someone on Twitter, et cetera. Uh, a few of you in the live audience indicated that you are active on Twitter and on Facebook, so you have your certain amount of followers and you have your certain amount of likes, et cetera. And it becomes a very, very mixed bag of communications because of social media and all of the different channels by which we can access one another now. Social media is also dialogic in nature. And what I mean by dialogic is very conversational, real time. 
and dialogic aspects of social media is what uh, an organization really utilizes in developing and maintaining relationships with various stakeholders. You know, Chris, if I could just interrupt for one second. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's questions in the audience so people can ask whenever they want, but when you started talking about it being borderless, one of the things that really came to my mind was um, how it's used in society. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking of what was happening in the Middle East uh, mm -hmm. two years ago uh, in terms of even the overthrow of the government. Right. And so, I mean, I think that's probably a key example of, of how social media was used in society to actually create an unbelievable change. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's beyond the organization. We're all focused on organizations. Right. Right. But um, it, it goes much beyond into society and the impacts for society. And you're absolutely right, Melanie, and that's one of the beautiful aspects of social media. Uh, because it is borderless, there is a vast uh, level of freedom in terms of uh, individuals being able to express thoughts. Uh, they're no longer afraid that someone's going to come knock down the door because they put out a, a leaflet of some kind that may uh, run counter to uh, political uh, ideology wherever they happen to reside. They can post something in anonymity and uh, have enjoy relative safely. Yes. So we have an audience question. So uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, the, I'm, I'm one of the largest social media like so many, mm -hmm. uh, and I have access to a lot of the different uh, social media channels and stuff. Many of our constituents, though, live on the other side of the digital. Mm. And so they are challenged with even accessing mm -hmm. much of the information. Right. So as this, uh, as this communication channel explodes, uh, a lot of those, that gap, if you will, between mm -hmm. right. those that have access and those that don't becomes uh, magnified, right. it grows. And I'm interested in your thoughts around some of the, uh, some of the impact that has just generally you know, the ability to either access information or the inability to access right. some of that information. Mm -hmm. well, that's a terrific question. Yeah, it's very insightful. And you know, for, for communication to be effective, the message has to be received. And you have to know something about your intended message recipients. Uh, it's often a mistake uh, made that social media is somehow supplanting more traditional forms of communication. It's not. It should be, if it's used effectively, uh, it should be used as a tool that complements other forms of communication, because you're absolutely right. Uh, I may have the newest computer, the newest tablet, the newest applications, and I can put all of the bells and whistles together in a social media-driven communication piece, but it's useless if someone doesn't have electricity, if they have uh, a computer that's a few generations older than mine, uh, all kinds of infrastructure problems that create barriers to me relaying the kinds of information that I want to relay and get feedback from my intended audience as well. So as we think about ways to communicate with various entities, we have to be cognizant about how they can receive what it is we want to transmit. And I think the other piece you've pointed to is that when we're talking particularly about crises such as a natural disaster or a health thing, the, a the ability to access information can be a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what that means is, and we'll be talking a little bit later and sharing with you and looking for examples from you, is we'll talk about redundancy. You have to have other, besides all the great social media that's out there, there has to be other ways, whether it's TV or radio or people driving in buses giving out information such as the Red Cross does. Because, as you've pointed out, it can be a matter of life and death. Uh, speaking to that point, one of the examples I personally experienced uh, a while ago when I was working for the Department of Energy was the response to Super Swarm Sandy. Yes. And one of the really effective uses of social media at that time by the, by the public, um, one of the things that the outcomes of that was a shortage of gasoline. Mm -hmm. People needed it to power their, their generators and other kinds of things um, as the days went on. And um, 
gasoline was being delivered to various stations, but it wasn't widespread. So people were tweeting where gas was available. Oh, and wonderful. people were using social media to find access to those kinds of resources. And that was a very, very effective use of social media for that particular disaster response mm -hmm. um, circumstance. But what I'm interested in as a federal employee, um, the use of social media kind of feeds into this public's expectation of instant information. Right. They want feedback right away. They want updates that constantly. And we, as a bureaucracy, don't tend to operate in that mode, even in disaster response. Mm -hmm. We like to analyze things, come up with an official departmental position, make sure it's approved before we release that information out. So our ability to participate in this forum of social media it, particularly in the rapid pace response right. of disaster um, response is a really um, a, almost a policy decision mm -hmm. that I think mm -hmm. needs to be factored in as well. Mm -hmm. And the other piece that you all have is an agency, say dealing with a crisis like Sandy or um, health or something, is that you want to make sure that you're accurate. Mm -hmm. Because in this day and age of all this input, Right? What's happening? Who's helping me with my house? I don't know. You know, my, my uh, basement is flooding. I don't know where to get. Disinformation. The disinformation. That's the pro part of the challenge. Is that lots of disinformation can happen. So the challenge for an agency is how do I get the accurate information out, and how do we correct the inaccurate information quickly? or help it to spread? You know, how do you make it go almost like a, um, an, a fast path that the, it keeps moving? This time it's, no, there's not a problem in this area. It's everything over there is fine. That kind of information is the challenge of how do you spread that? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know how to use social media more effectively to reach not only older populations, but marginalized populations as a method of outreach and enabling them to become more of a part of a community? Oh, great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. And I think it relates to this gentleman's point as well uh, in terms of how people access information. And uh, older uh, uh, populations now, uh, my mother being one of them, uh, she was mentioning just last night she plans to buy a, a laptop. And I know what that means. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, it means I'm going to be in the store with her to buy this laptop. And you're going to be helping her. Exactly, exactly. But uh, they are active, uh, particularly as it relates to health care matters. Uh, they want to be in, engaged, informed, so that they can make informed decisions about their, 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 their life, their finances. So it, it's very important. Uh, we just have to be mindful about, you know, how they want to get their information. Uh, social media is very powerful. It, it's very engaging. But there are various levels of social media as well. We can use Facebook, we can use Twitter, Instagram, etc. But depending on your target audience, they may not need all of those other things that would be inserted in that. Just basic information that is accessible through these various uh, platforms. So, excellent point. And to add to that, <clears throat> we're there are places that are trying to work or at least provide some accessibility, such as libraries. I think you all may have noticed the increased use by varying populations to libraries. And yesterday I was at a conference, and there's another group that we need to think about, and that's those with disabilities. Yes. If you're sending everything out audio and people can't hear, this, at this particular area they were selling software that would help or something. But that's another thing to think about. Mm -hmm. If you can't see, how does that text message or whatever get out? So it's made it responsibility now adds layers that we have to investigate and figure out how to deal with. Mm -hmm. So as, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we're going to look at crisis prepared organizations and crisis prone organizations. Now, in terms of crisis prepared organizations, there are various things that distinguish them. Uh, they anticipate, respond to, and learn from not only their own experiences, triumphs as well as mistakes, but those of others in what's known as vicarious learning. Uh, 
they're also operating in a, in a mindset of controlled paranoia. Uh, crises will visit us. Uh, that, that's inevitable. Sometimes we don't know when, where, or how, but at some point, each organization is going to deal with some form of emergency. That's just a fact of life. And crisis prepared organizations anticipate the likelihood of unfortunate events and they plan for them, they strategize, they rehearse uh, different scenarios, uh, much like a fire drill, but this is a crisis drill. Various individuals throughout the organization know their roles, those individuals know the roles of others, and there is a fallback plan in the event that some of those individuals are not available. So there's a system, as, as Claudine alluded to, of redundancies so that there are different layers of support so that there's no balls dropped, hopefully. Uh, but crisis prepared organizations are very adept at, at all of these things and they institute teams that are very media savvy in terms of monitoring uh, their, not only their own technologies but the technologies of others and they develop ways to communicate as quickly as possible uh, in, in informing stakeholders about uh, crisis related situations but uh, you're absolutely right. I'd rather have correct information that takes a little time versus inaccurate information that's just spewed out uh, very fast. Chris, can I just ask one other question? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of crisis, sometimes I feel like words are overused and people don't really know what a real crisis is and, mm -hmm. what, and, and what's not a crisis. Uh, do you have some definitions or something that you, we can talk about in terms of what would actually constitute a crisis? Sure, uh, a crisis is a situation, whether it's man-made or natural, that threatens ongoing operations, organizational operations, may threaten the very existence uh, of an organization or life and cause irreparable damage. That's essentially what a crisis is. Okay. Because sometimes we talk about there's a problem in the office mm -hmm. or something, right. and we characterize it as a crisis, crisis. but uh, you know, it never really is. No. No. So I just wanted to make sure the audience was aware of what an actual crisis constitutes. Uh, absolutely, and, and that's, uh, th what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, iconic. I hear so many things described as iconic now, and, and that just diminishes what an iconic thing actually is. Uh, not everything is a crisis right. even. Mm -hmm. Now by contrast, Crisis-prone organizations are everything that a crisis-prepared organization is not. Uh, a crisis-prone organization uh, very rarely learns from its own mistakes or the mistakes of others. Uh, they also attempt to force fit what they did in the past into new and possibly unrelated situations. And uh, last, you know, we're, all, we're operating in a systemic world now where so many things are tightly coupled. If something goes wrong over here, it's going to trigger an event over here. But crisis-prone organizations continue to uh, approach crisis situations with a machine-age mentality versus uh, a systems-age mentality when the problems are actually systemic in nature. Would you say your organizations are moving towards being crisis prepared or not sure yet? Well, it's very interesting considering the discussion you just had about the um, essential uh, aspect of practicing mm -hmm. and planning for these crises. When you think about that in terms of the integration of new media, you can't really practice a fire drill on, twi on Twitter. Right. Because if you did, people would believe it. So um, we can certainly do contingency planning and um, disaster management planning and succession planning for internal processes. But how do you integrate this new technology into those kinds of concepts? The, the integration takes place in, in various uh, re rehearsal scenarios. First, you have to um, make sure that everyone in the organization knows that it's a practice, it's, it's not real. And, and that requires a bit of, of internal PR and communication uh, to, to make that happen. And again, social media 
is a complement to the other things that you're doing within your organization. So you have various forms of email alerts, text messaging, Facebook, Twitter, if in fact you still have power and have a screen of some kind uh, to look at. So it would be a mistake to rely solely on social media as a, as a communication support in your emergency or crisis planning, but it can certainly be an important component in the event those apparatus are still available to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I would suspect that many of the agencies and perhaps even your communities have alert systems mm -hmm. that you can sign up for. And you can test that in the agency by saying, just like they did, I suppose, in the old fire drills, at such and such time, we're going to have a practice. So you can test that at least internally. You're quite right, without the kind of practice pilot that um, Chris is talking about in a community, you can still test whether this thing works or is it a Twitter notice or whatever so people know what to expect when, it, when they get a message, um, there's a fire in the basement or something or a, a pipe broke. They know that this is coming on Twitter or it's coming on an alert, but you don't get tons of inf things coming at the same time. You have a system in place that you've practiced at least internally. Well, they do, oh, I'm sorry, they do that often at universities. Yes. You know, so there's often now, unfortunately, there's often a lot of incidences at universities. Mm -hmm. And so they will say there's a lockdown. They do that mm -hmm. at schools right. also. Yeah. They'll say there's a lockdown, they send messages out. And so, and that, that's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so people are alerted to what's happening. And with these rehearsals, you know, it also offers the opportunity to self-evaluate. Uh, because no matter how much you practice, there's always something uh, that can be improved upon. So being critical about what you do is only going to benefit your ability to uh, be more responsive in the event the real situation does occur. And as a sort of practical example, and this, this is not just for universities, but since we like to send, if something goes on and the system is down or you're going to say that we can't do whatever today, you have everybody's email. But what if the place you have the email is no longer working? Mm -hmm. right. Have you got those emails somewhere else? So you can use your home computer when you get home or whatever it is. Sort of this backup system that enables you to communicate if the main communication channel isn't working. or. Maybe there's a, the old, what do they call that, um, announcements. I don't know if that even exists anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, you might have to have it for a fire, like this is a fire or whatever, saying, look, this has happened, stay calm or whatever. But again, so people know that that's the, met, the approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as we were uh, developing this presentation, there, there are several examples of, of crisis communication and media and lessons learned, uh, good lessons as well as bad lessons. Uh, unfortunately, and, and, and Melanie uh, alluded to this, uh, there are so many shootings uh, everywhere and, and we, could, we could spend the next month just dealing with you know, incidents of shootings. So, so we just put a, a couple here. The Overland Park, uh, Kansas Jew Jewish Community Center. Uh, in 2014, some of the lessons learned there uh, an inability to quickly uh, send emergency warnings. Uh, similarly, at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, seven years ago, there needed to be a more extensive and varied way uh, to integrate communications. Uh, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Now, I was actually living in Mississippi during both of those, uh, so I've, I've got some firsthand uh, experience with that. But what we learned in, in those cases was the need to have much more robust pre-event uh, preparedness and better coordination between local, state, and uh, federal uh, entities. And as I mentioned earlier, there's been a power shift as a result of social media where it's no longer uh, the sole province of a company or an organization in terms of what's communicated, how, when, et cetera. Now it's reversed. Uh, stakeholders have the majority of that power. Uh, Dell Computer, a few years ago, decided to save money by outsourcing its uh, customer service. 
and one of its uh, very, very media savvy uh, and disgruntled uh, customers decided to you know, wage a blog war <laughs> with Dell and just repeat his horrific uh, experiences with their new customer service operation. And of course, others added to this blog and snowballed. So it became a, a public relations nightmare for Dell as a result of various customers' ability to blog their, their, their degrees of discontent. Toyota, in 2009, as a result of the situation involving out-of-control acceleration in some of uh, its vehicles, it already had a, a social media team in place, but it did not uh, focus social media efforts on reputation repair. Now it needed to repair uh, a certain level of reputation. So its social media team focused entirely on developing Facebook interactions with potential customers and other customers. And what Toyota did was not censor the Facebook page and only allow those things that were positive about the, the automaker to appear on Facebook, but it was a uh, a community of different discussions of customers and potential customers talking about their experiences with their automobiles and uh, encouraging others to, to give Toyota a try. So initially, it was a very good approach in terms of using social media to address a reputation uh, issue and a crisis. There are several examples. This is by no means intended to be an exhaustive list of uh, crisis communication and media that we found. Many of you are probably aware uh, and familiar with Ready.gov, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is very, very good at uh, social media communication and uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, in talking with uh, representatives at the uh, Department of Energy, uh, they told Claudine and I about the Office of Digital Strategy. I believe they have about eight or nine people who are dedicated all day, every day, to developing and cultivating their social media presence. Uh, they've also developed uh, protocols in terms of how to deal with incorrect information that they see. They don't pull it down, they just address it and keep moving. So it's a very interactive, very effective way that uh, they stay in touch with their various stakeholders at DOE. Um, can I ask a question, actually, of all of you? One of the things that the Department of Energy and some others do is retweet messages to pass it along. It's kind of a, the old partnerships that you had to do by phone or however, and saying if we're in trouble. Does that happen in your agencies? Let's say, we, I know we have HUD. Is that what you do? It does, yes. So if something's going on um, from that you'll hear about from FEMA, and it affects housing, or even if it doesn't, you would pass that along? Yes. Okay, so that's a partnership. How many of these partnerships, is it with lots of agencies, or just how do you decide, or is it just open-ended, an agency if, will say? If you, ha if you can, if you could come to the microphone so the internet audience can hear. That you pass along essentially this partnership saying, help us pass so, it along. On your so, our account. Office of Public Affairs basically handles that on behalf of uh, our department here. And they do regular, basically, scans uh, of other agency tweets, if you will. And I'm pretty convinced that the other agencies do the same thing. Uh -huh. And so, you know, in my mind, that's the strength mm -hmm. of an environmental communication channel like Twitter where that growth is organic through retweets. And uh, that's, that's an incredibly powerful way of right. getting the message out. That's right. Great. Very you know, good. one other thing, too, uh, in terms of the government, um, and we sort of live in an app sort of world yeah. now, mm -hmm. so, um, but I just didn't happen to see it on the list, was the Office of Personal Management. Mm. You can download an app from the Office of Personal Management, and it will tell you the status of the federal, what's going on in the federal government. Mm. So, for instance, last winter, when we had all the bad weather, mm -hmm. uh, you could get those immediate messages. Right. It, it's interesting. I, I was at the Department of Energy when Superstorm Standard was going on, and I, I saw some of that, that the activity that was going on. 
a couple of things were happening. There was a, a very strong partnership and collaboration among the federal agencies, DHS and FEMA, DOE, um, uh, HUD and others, that all had um, kind of a vested interest in aspects of the impact of that storm in that region of the, of the country. And there was a lot of communication, a lot of it was supported through various, uh, a variety of, of uh, communication channels. But um, you were kind of asking about retweets and things like that. We in the government seem to be much better, a, a little more forward thinking in gathering information from social media than in using it to push information mm. out. Because okay. one of the things we did see very early on is um, starting to scan the, the social media tweets to see where things were happening, where there seemed to be instances people were tweeting about certain types of, of um, concerns or activity in the region, and then they were focusing resources into those areas to address those issues. They were using it as a, an information gathering mm -hmm. mechanism. We're pretty good at that. We're less adept at using it to broadcast information out. Um, but, but this idea of scanning and using it as an information resource, um, the federal government has jumped on pretty well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. Excellent. Any other examples? I'm well, sure there's people on the internet waving, waving their hands, hand. dying to get into Where, the conversation. Where's that next stage of development? Right. I want to see them waving at us. Well, that, I think you've made a critical point. One is the gathering and the other is the push to share the information. And I'm, I would suspect that people are working on that if they're not doing that already, because it's been several years. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, how do you push out what's accurate rather than what's a concern? Mm -hmm. And another example that we have is you know, the National Weather Service, uh, which is very robust in its uh, social media participation via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and what have you. And it's particularly uh, useful in, uh, in areas like California uh, that's dealing with uh, unseasonal uh, wildfires, for example, flooding that has happened in different parts of the world. And they have the mechanisms by which their, uh, their boots on the ground, so to speak, can provide eye reports where uh, with the mobile phone, a tablet, they become uh, their local uh, neighborhood meteorologist and report weather conditions when someone from the National Weather Service is either on route or can't get there right away. But the information is still being funneled back to global audiences via social media. So uh, the National Weather Service is another very good example of an agency that has leveraged the power of social media as an additional tool uh, to serve various publics. And it's not just the federal government uh, that is good at this or are getting good at this, uh, particularly in the Washington metropolitan area where, as, as I said, as so many things are systemic now. If something takes place in Washington, D.C., invariably it's going to impact Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Howard, Anne Arundel, et cetera. So various uh, county and local governments have established very good uh, avenues by which to alert their constituents via emails, alert messages, et cetera, uh, much of which is uh, social media based. And um, for those of you, you'll be able to get these slides if you want to copy those uh, web links. One of the things I did like about them is that right on at least two of them, Montgomery and Arlington County, the f home page that you get to that has emergency has an alert button where you can sign up. So again, that's pushing it out. You don't have to wait and go through Google and try and figure out how do I find out. You can get those alerts. And, and one of the other things that we discovered uh, as we looked at these various sites uh, uh, with these various agencies, uh, local, state, and federal, uh, the information is readily accessible in terms of, OK, I want to find out information about this particular emergency. Well, there's a link right there. You don't have to go down four or five pages and try to figure out where you are to get to something. Uh, because these tools are only useful if they are doing the job that it's intended to do. And if uh, an individual, particularly in an emergency situation, is spending uh, an inordinate amount of time trying to find information on a site, uh, it becomes very, very frustrating. Uh, in terms of uh, 
internal versus external communication. These different forms of communication have their own distinct purposes, of course, but at the intersection of internal and external communication is where effective uh, crisis and emergency planning takes place. Claudine. Okay. So here's an area that I think we're all interested, concerned about, and realize that is sometimes overlooked. That is, what about the staff, mm -hmm. the people in the organization? And we can do a lot of planning and so on, external, but we need to think also about how the staff are impacted, affected, how do they um, communicate, how do they know, some of what we talked about before, right? <clears throat> how do you tell other people you practice so they know if there's an emergency, where to go and what to do? And then there's um, some agencies and um, are very concerned about confidentiality, so you have to be very careful that um, if you're involved in something, if you're putting something out on Twitter that not or on Facebook, not necessarily negative, but anything, if your agency has, say, a case, you may not be able to participate or be part of that mm -hmm. because of your personal friendships. When it, and the, we, we had to point out something you all know, or maybe belabor the obvious, which is confidentiality. There was, amazingly, at least to me, a case from a national security staffer, Mr. Joseph, who had been sharing comments about his agency under this <laughs> seemingly assumed name, Natsec Wonk. And it was not, what he was sharing was both confidential and also, yes, not pleasant. And eventually, they figured out who it was and he was fired. But this is another danger we may be so used to sharing things <clears throat> that we forget that we can't share this stuff externally. I, I don't think that was his issue. I think he knew what he was doing because he had a fake name and everything. <laughs> but to keep in mind that you can't, it's not, everything is not open to talk, discussion, which may be a hard lesson these days since people seem to feel they can talk about all kinds of personal things. <laughs> Sir. So there's a, uh, you know, clearly there's a distinct line between classified or confidential material, but I think there's also a slippery slope and a kind of a gray line between an individual that is potentially in a leadership position in an organization tweeting information in a personal Twitter account. Mm -hmm. You know, you see a lot of profiles with the caveat in there that these reflect my own personal opinions. But the reality is, you know, it's not difficult to make a correlation between somebody's personal account and what they do professionally. Right. That's right. And so, you know, I'm curious on your thoughts on, you know, how, how are we going to balance those things going forward, not only as individuals, but legally? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, most organizations have, uh, now that social media has taken off the way it has, uh, organizations have developed uh, social media policies to address those very things and what uh, their organizational members are allowed to do versus what they are not allowed to do and various uh, repercussions associated with those kinds of activities. So I believe that starts to get at, at that kind of uh, a challenge. And, and the other thing, you know, Mr. Joseph, uh, he, he uh, posted what he posted uh, anonymously. But the lesson here is that nothing that we put online is anonymous. It can always get back to you somehow. It's, mm -hmm. it's like the notion that simply because I deleted an email, it went off somewhere and it's never to be found. No, someone who knows what they're doing can go in and retrieve that email and, and do what they're going to do with it. But nothing that we do in our online lives is ever actually anonymous. And that's one of the many lessons uh, to be learned from, from this particular gentleman's example. I also think, um, I guess I'll have two points. Number one, at where I work and where many of you work, we're only <clears throat> supposed to use the 
um, organizational address for organizational business. You know, every time we click on, we say yes. I cannot tell you how many people I get emails, personal emails, let's have dinner, with their organizational email address. And I am astounded. I keep two separate ones, partly because of that rule, but also because it keeps my life separate. I'm pretty happy to separate out what. But I am astounded at the personal kinds of emails, opinions about something in the news or whatever, that people are using their organizational email addresses. So that's number one. The second one is, I think the media world that we're in, had, people have, have to come back on some level to being a grown-up, <laughs> which I mean, by which I mean, not everything, single thing that goes on in your life and everything you think about has to be shared. Or eat. Or eat. Or, eat. <laughs> <laughs> or every meal doesn't right. need to be shared. I mean, I must, certainly I hear about it. So and so tweeted they like this rest. I don't know. But, and maybe it's because a generational difference where privacy or personal was, had a clear boundary, at least for me. But I think that's another issue, and certainly in terms of the kind of work we all do. Not every single thing that you feel about your workplace, about this person, about whether you like the new office, needs to be shared electronically. So that combination of, please separate your emails, that's my personal, get a personal one and use it for personal things, and to be a grown up about what you're sharing on both of them. And there's implications for that very discussion related to crisis management as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thought that comes to mind, I was here in D.C. in an eight-story building when we had a little uh, earthquake yes. a couple of years I ago. And I happened to be on the eighth floor, and the floor shook pretty good. <laughs> and it wasn't clear if we were to evacuate the building yes. or not. Perfect. It wasn't clear if we were to evacuate the city or not. Mm. And there were a lot of people with opinions and a lot of people were, you know, did you feel that? And, and there was a lot of chatter going on both on their private communications and on their business emails. Mm -hmm. and, and none of that was bad, I think. But I think exactly. it's important to remember that there are individuals who've been given the responsibility within an organization to be the ones to declare it's time to evacuate, right. to be right. the ones to declare um, you should avoid metro, you should evacuate the mm -hmm. city on surface, first surface transport only. Mm -hmm. And that those kinds of communications, there's a reason why there are people who've been invested with those responsibilities and we as individuals should not try to insert ourselves into that process. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent yes. point. Perfect. And it's, a, it's really a perfect example. Here are some items that we put down about to think about, the pra again, the practice. Here's what we would do if there's a, um, a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that. And then to, to continue um, some of these. And the other piece of that is not to forget that people here are related, as it were, to families and friends. How do you connect people in the workforce, enable them to communicate with their families if there is this earthquake and you're evacuated and people are going to worry? So that other aspect of your life and our lives as we're inside the organization when, let's say, there is this earthquake. Over to you, Chris. Mm -hmm. now, some of the recommendations uh, that we uh, want to share with you today, and of course this is not an exhaustive list either, but there are some things that uh, crisis prepared organizations uh, should address. Uh, one, assign a cross-functional team to monitor social networking sites. And it needs to be cross-functional so that there's a broad representation of the organization itself, different decision makers, different levels of decision makers, and some cross-functionality in terms of of uh, being able to, to pick up the slack in the event that one or more team members is absent. Uh, continu continually develop those portfolios of crisis scenarios as part of your, uh, your preparation. Third, establish not only a physical but also a virtual crisis or emergency management team because depending on the situation, an earthquake, a flood, fire, war, you may not be able to come together physically, so there needs to be a method by which you can communicate and make decisions in virtual space. The other way. 
What did you want to do? Next. Okay. Uh, establish a system of communication and information redundancy. As uh, Claudine mentioned earlier, there needs to be more than one channel by which the communication, it could be identical pieces of communication, gets disseminated. But if your building implodes and that's the only uh, place where you have a mechanism by which to communicate, then you're done. Uh, you need to have different channels by which to, to communicate with different people and establish protocols for how you address incorrect information that appears on social media. That's, uh, that's very important problem. as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you want to say a comment about Nestle? Oh, yes. Uh, we like these exam <laughs> bad examples. <laughs> Nestle is very much a bad example, uh, the, the, the chocolate maker. They were embroiled in a dispute a few years ago with Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace uh, uh, alleged that Nestle was uh, engaged in deforestation uh, to develop resources to make its Kit Kat bars. And there were several negative things posted about Nestle on Nestle's Facebook page. And instead of addressing the problem head on, Nestle's response was, oh, let's just get these off of our Facebook page and, and they'll just go away. But of course, once people see something, simply because it drops off the Facebook page does not mean that their memory has been washed. So uh, that's an example of uh, a lack of, of wise protocols in terms of how you manage correct and or incorrect information on your own sites. And this is a graphic uh, that illustrates the crisis management process of a crisis prepared organization. It's multi-directional in nature, goes through various phases, crisis preparation being the first phase. You move into crisis containment, crisis recovery being the third phase, organizational learning being the fourth phase. But it's moving multi-directionally because this learning process is taking place at each stage. And at the hub of all of these activities is new media uh, technologies enable communication. Everything passes through our various forms of communication including social media. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank this you. Was a, this was a terrific session. I think we all learned a lot, actually, and a lot of things we didn't know we were at least had an opportunity to learn about. So with that, I would like to invite you all to attend our June session of our OCIO Learning Session, where we will be hosting Dr. Catherine Hand and Dawn Singer from uh, the FDIC. They're gonna be talking about how do you build an organizational culture of excellence, mm -hmm. and how do you move to the top in terms of uh, best places to work in the government. So we look forward to you joining us then. So thank you all very much, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>